Well, good morning, everyone. Isn't it a, I was just telling Barbara, isn't it a lovely Lord's Day today? I tell you, after not a very promising start yesterday, uh, we have a simply gorgeous Lord's Day uh, on this uh, third Sunday of uh, Advent. Uh, and this is known as Rejoicing Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent. Our angel tree gifts, thanks to everyone who participated in this annual tradition. Uh, the presents and food baskets will be delivered this week. So they will be going out with our prayers and our gratitude to all of you who participated. Preschool Christmas program is at 6.30 tomorrow in the sanctuary. Refreshments will be served afterwards in the activities building. I think we're going to bring Margot because we're babysitting tomorrow night, but should this be another two-year-old in the midst of two-year-olds? So. Preschool Christmas parties will be at 11 a.m. Tuesday uh, and a noon dismissal for all. Uh, the staff will meet at 12.30 in the fellowship hall probably to go on oxygen and uh, IV solution. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, all right. Christmas holidays for East Baton Rouge Public Schools will begin Wednesday, December the 20th through Thursday, January the 4th. So they've already started. They're about to start. Yeah. They're already out? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, they're already partying then. All right. I live across the street from Magnolia Elementary, so that means that we don't have traffic in the morning. That's always kind of nice. Uh, church office will be closed. You mean we're getting a break? Church office will be closed Friday, December 22nd, and Monday through Tuesday, December 25th the 26th, in celebration of Christmas. The staff would like to wish every one of you a very Merry Christmas. We love you, but we're going home, right? Uh, Christmas Eve will be next Sunday. Uh, I will have a regular worship service, and um, at the worship service, if you were here last year, um, you know that uh, the innkeeper and Edmundo brought the sermon, and back by popular man demand, Edmundo and the innkeeper are doing the sermon next Sunday, so we hope that you'll be here for that. Um, Christmas Eve candlelight communion service will be held at 5 next Sunday. Uh, we're just going to be here all day, you know what? Uh, maybe we should just build a fire and make s'mores in the afternoon. Huh? Uh, um, friendship pads, take a moment to sign. And in particular, please let us know if you have any prayer requests. Are there any announcements that should have been made that we may have overlooked? Seeing none, then let us begin our service of worship.
Let us pray. Ooh. Almighty God, you have made us and all things to serve you. Now prepare the world for your rule. Come quickly to save us so that wars and violence shall end and your children may live in peace, honoring one another with justice and love. Through Jesus Christ, who lives with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. When we, come, when we come to worship God, we must first remember who we are and as people who often sin and turn from the ways of God. Relying on God's abundant grace, let us offer our confession t together, knowing that we will be offered forgiveness in Christ. Gracious God, Long ago, you sent Christ to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to proclaim liberty to the captives. You then asked us to go and do the same, for we are the church of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, we pray, for we have not continued to share the good news. We have focused on ourselves and neglected to help others. Help us to continue to share the healing and loving words of Christ to all the world and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Hear the good news. Through the grace and love of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I see you. I see you, Emmett. Come on down. <laughs> he has to be a veterinarian. He always has an animal with him, don't you think? <clears throat> okay, why don't you scoot over closer to the boys? I think I'm doing this for all the guys. How many of you grew up like I did with Roy Rogers and Dale Evans? All right? You know who I'm talking about. You guys are going to be introduced to some of my favorite people. Roy Rogers had a real name. It was Leonard Sly. I like Roy Rogers better. He was known as the king of the cowboys. And he had a very famous horse whose name was Trigger. And I'm reminded that Elizabeth tells me that Willie Nelson has a guitar named Trigger. I said, yeah, it's named after the horse. Exactly. And Dale Evans had a horse named Buttermilk. And they rode those horses, and they got rid of more bad guys, and Roy would call them polecats, those darn varmints, those polecats. Well, he wrote a book, and the name of his book is My Favorite Christmas Story. Now, he and Dale had been married when he became a Christian, and she wrote the beginning of the story for him. And then I'm going to read to you a couple of the things that he had to say. We pay taxes in the United States, and we grumble when we pay, and we say it isn't fair. We should have been around when Caesar Augustus was, was foreman of the ranch. If you, paid a, if you were a Jew in Judea, you paid and you paid and you paid. You paid Jewish taxes, support for the temple, which means paying to keep the priest who really had it good. Every male Jew over 12 years of ages had to kick in to keep those priests living in luxury. Can you imagine 12 years old and paying taxes? Scary, huh? You barely have enough of an allowance to do that, okay? There was a temple tribute. There was a tithe on crops, cattle, wheat, figs, olives, the tree and grapes on the vine, barley, honey. When a special day or event came around, there was a tax to help you celebrate it. Every time a firstborn son or a male animal was born, you paid a tax, which was called an offering, whether you were really thankful or not. If you sinned, you paid a tax because you were sorry for it. And there was always a special drive for some special purpose being put on by the priest in the temple. But when you paid all that up, then along came Caesar Augustus and his Romans. They taxed you for the Roman roads they built across your lands. They taxed you even for a salt tax. Can you imagine paying tax, a, a federal tax on salt of all things? Well. Mr. Rogers did a real good job of researching all that and finding out what all people had to pay for. Now, up in Nazareth lived a family, Joseph and Mary, and they packed up and started down the long, long road down to Bethlehem. That was a town where Joseph's family had lived. That's one of the few things we actually know about Joseph, by the way. Joseph didn't like the idea of that trip because Mary was about to have a baby. And they were having to ride. He was uh, leading, and Mary was riding a donkey. Not a very comfortable ride for anybody. If you've ever ridden a donkey, mm -mm, a nice big horse with a saddle is a whole lot better. Have you ever ridden a different kind of animal? Have you ridden an elephant? A camel? So this is kind of fun, but they're not exactly comfortable, huh? Okay. Mary, on that donkey, 90 miles. 90 miles she rode. That's to Hammond and back and then a little bit more. I wonder what she was thinking when she came to that little bitty town. In her heart, she knew how blessed she was that God had chosen her. But this wasn't even Joseph's baby. This was the Son of God waiting to be born in Bethlehem. I think the blessedness came back to her when she thought about that. And she knew that God had chosen her so God would see that everything was going to be all right. It wasn't any accident that they were in Bethlehem that night. Even Caesar Augustus had a little to do with it. Long time ago as a child, Mary had read in the old Jewish scriptures that there was going to be a baby born in Bethlehem. Mary knew. Nobody else did, but Mary knew. 
What fascinates me about Christmas, it's not just a day to pass around presents to everybody or one day in the year when you're nice to everybody whether you love them or not. It's the day God Almighty chose to give us his only begotten son. And he did that through Mary of Nazareth. How can we miss that? Most of the folks in Bethlehem missed it when Joseph knocked on the door of the little inn. Do you know what the man told him? Two terribly sad words. No room. No room. We don't have any room for you. They didn't have welcome on their doormats. They wouldn't have opened the door for a stranger from some other country. They just couldn't do that. The courtyard was jammed with all kinds of people. And there were camels. And the inn was crowded. You couldn't even go in there and stand up. Joseph must have known there wasn't any room for them, but what else could he do? Knock, knock, knock. He knocked again. A baby's about to be born. The most important baby ever to be born on this earth. Let us in. Let him in. Out of the cold in the night. Knock, knock, knock. The sleepy innkeeper came rubbing his eyes. He didn't waste any words. Again, he said, no room. Those are the most heart-rending words in the Bible. No room. Would you have said that? Ah, uh, but don't sometimes we say it every day? You don't say it to Christ when he asks you for your heart. Go away and let me sleep. I'm tired. I've got no time for you. No room in my heart. I don't know you. You know, we're all innkeepers. We really are. We have room for anybody and everybody except him. Except that little baby Jesus. Not many of us really let him in. I once heard of an old Scottish preacher who would go around knocking on the doors in his town. And whoever would answer, he would say, Does Jesus Christ live here? People stared at him. They told jokes about him. They thought he was little nuts. Did those jokers wisecrack just because they had to cover up a guilty conscience, you think? I agree. Now, it's one thing to know that all these ideas and all these situations were going on. But I have one more little thing I want you to hear, and it's just so funny to me. But anyway, Christmas to Roy Rogers is you stand there, and all the world stands still around you. And you don't see anything except that baby in the feeding box because that's the only place they had to make him a bed. If you've got a heart, your heart is breaking by now. That's Christmas to me, standing at the manger. It was a stable. Yep, it was a mean place for a little boy to be born, a mean place even for animals. It wasn't nearly as fine a stable as Trigger has. It wasn't the light shining through the artist, shining places where people have painted. It was a dark, damp hole in the ground this is where Jesus was born you don't like it you don't think the son of God should have been born in a palace or at least a place where it wasn't dirty and dark but that would not have been right because God was sending his son into a world that was a filthy stable a world dark with pain hatred and dirty with sin it was right for Jesus to be born here for he had come to make men clean and to build a bright new feeling into their hearts. He was to drive away the darkness in men's minds. I'm not a theologian, but I don't have an education in theology, but I know the reason he came might not have impressed or pleased all the theologian, but theologians, but that's the way it looks to me. I cannot put this in fancy language, but I can say that Jesus brought light and peace and something new and clean and fine into my life. And that's all the theology I need to trust in Jesus. May we pray. Thank you, Father, for what a wonderful story that you've given us. Thank you for leading us to your stable. Thank you for letting us ponder 
the things that that family went through and that they know they're going to go through. We ask you to lead us, to help us, guide us. And may we be in your light and may we do as you were to have us do. In that little bitty baby Jesus' name we all say, Amen. Thank you. Gracious God, for generations your word has brought love and life to your people. Speak to us now. We pray that we may hear, and in hearing we may be transformed. Amen. The first reading today is from Isaiah, chapter 61, 1 through 4, and 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has appointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the, the oppressed, to bind up the heartbroken, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former desert the desolation. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my whole being shall exalt in my God. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the rites of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garment, garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels for as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden comes what is shown in it to spring up so that the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations the word of the Lord thanks be to God
Thank you so very much, choir. Beautiful. Come, Messiah. The Advent Prayer. The second reading comes from the Apostle Paul's first letter to Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this portion of his holy and sacred word. Amen. Are you from a part of the country where people talk slowly? I am. I was raised in Arkansas, and it's just hard for me to attune my ear to people who talk rapidly. Um, I had to recently go in for what, that favorite of all tests, second only to the root canal, and that's the colonoscopy. You know that one? You had to go, you had to go there? And you know, Medicare sends you to one of these, I call them colonoscopy factories. You walk in, there's like 25 other people waiting to get their prep medication. And so you sit there for a while and they finally call you back. And the med tech, probably for the 50th time that day, is having to go through the questions with you. And so I sat down. And she said, I need to list all my medications you have taken over there. If you're taking any bullet pending medications, are you taking any bullet pending medications? I said, what? Let me back up a little. I'm from Arkansas, where we speak very slowly. I remember one time I was going to visit my mother when she lived in Arkansas. I was in the restaurant. And there was one guy ahead of me. And he, they said, what can we get you, sir? And he said, well, and we always start every sentence with, well, you got to stretch it out, too. He said, I got a question. The sausage that you do here, is it link sausage or is it patty sausage? Because if it's link sausage, I don't really care for it. But if it's patty sausage, I'll take some. And I'm sitting there thinking, I hope the holidays are not over before I make it to my mother's house. That's where I'm from. Long drawn out well. I'm reminded of that because Paul, here at the close of his letter, is rattling some stuff off, parting shots. He's about to run out of paper on his parchment, so he's got to get a whole lot in at the, at the same time. And so he just rattles it off. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. And you sort of say, wow, wow. So I suggest that we slow down a little bit and look at this and see how it can help us prepare for Christmas. As I mentioned a few months ago when I was preaching from Thessalonica, that this is the earliest New Testament document. A small church had been started. They were very tiny. They had left behind their old ways. And they lived in the midst of a city that was just full of gods. You could go out at the bay and if it was a nice clear day like today, you could look across the bay and in the distance you could see Mount Olympus where their gods dwelled. The gods up there drinking ambrosia, Zeus, the head of them. And if you bribed him with a sacrifice, maybe he would give you what you want if you bribed him just right. That was the God that they worshipped. And then there were cults, Isis cult. This involved nighttime meetings of repentance and humility where they would ask the spirit of Isis to come and take them over. This was from the east. Now that they had left all of these gods behind, they had become very suspicious. People said, who are these Christians and why are they not worshiping Zeus or Isis anymore? Why are they worshiping this new god? And they were very suspicious of all of them. 
That's not the only parallel with today because don't we live in the midst of a lot of false gods as well? Don't we walk in the midst of a pantheon of false gods in our age today? Uh, now, this is where I'm going to impress you with my seminary education. I'm going to give you some of these false gods. I'm going to give you to them in their original language and then I will translate them for you. These are some of the false gods that we live among today, especially at Christmas time. There is the god Indulgius Tumuchius Excelsus. You heard about that one? This is the god. Now, now some of these gods also have a female consort that goes with them. And this one does happen to have a female consort that her name is Diabedia. You ever heard of Diabedia? This is the one that I would tell you not to do this one. But as I said in a news article a few couple months ago, unfortunately that I worship at this altar, the evidence is all around me. I, I can't deny that I worship at this altar. And don't we all in Louisiana? Oh my goodness. Don't we all? But you know, this is a false god. The purpose of Christmas isn't to gather around the goody table. It's to gather around the manger. And sometimes we forget that. We put so much emphasis on this false god, we forget what the central purpose of the holiday is. Then there is another false god, Exhaustus Fatigamon. You heard about that one? And the consort for this one is Rhodus Runus. This is where you just run from thing to thing and event to event and you never stop and pause and think about what this holiday is all about. You're just running around, busy all the time, so busy you can't even think about it. That's a false god that we need to leave behind. There's a recent addition, Hallmarchius. Have you heard of Hallmarchius? And his consort, Metis Cutis. Have you heard of this one? It's a false god. In this one, there is a god who is a perfectly, disgustingly specimen of humanity. Disgustingly perfect. Always named Chad. And he falls in love, then breaks up, and then gets back together. I'm, I'm told that they are trying to come up with a second plot to Hallmarchius. But in all the sacred writings, that's how it always happens. They meet cute, they break up, and they get back together. And this is the god of just forgetting everything and celebrating silly emotions. All against this, Paul says, there's a lovely trinity for Christmas, rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks. Now we don't rejoice because everything that happens to us is good. And he isn't dealing here with catastrophic loss, which is where uh, something just completely overwhelms us. Rather, he's talking about the fact that each and every day we ought to rejoice and give thanks to God for all of our blessings. This last Sunday, we had lessons and carols, which meant that I had Sunday off. It was kind of nice. And so I called up this gal that I've been dating for a while, and I said, uh, would you like to go see Lily in her play and, uh, at the Baton Rouge Theater? And, and she, she said, yes. And uh, so we went on Saturday night. I'm always working on my sermon Saturday night. We went on Saturday night, and we saw A Christmas Carol, which is one of the most profoundly theological stories I have ever heard. You know it very well, the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, you know it very well. But the part that jumped out at me this time was Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim goes with his father to church. Do you remember that part? Goes with his father to church. And when they get home, uh, the wife says, how was Tiny Tim in church? Oh, as good as gold and better, says Bob Cratchit. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you have ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars to walk and blind men to see. Isn't that beautiful? Turning something bad into something good 
You know, we give thanks for the good and we ask God to give us strength for the bad, but in both cases, we turn to God and we can rejoice because God is with us in the good and the bad. Pray without ceasing, says Paul. Wow, can you do that? If any of you are going to start doing that, please let me know when you get off of the parking lot, and that's when Claire and I will leave the church. If you're out there praying while driving, uh, there is a God, another false God in our society, who does involve people in prayer all the time. At least that's what I assume they're doing. Have, have you noticed as you go around, there's these people going like this all the time? You ever notice that? They're walking around like this all the time, walking around with their heads bowed down. I'm not sure why. They have some kind of a little false god in their hands, and they're just constantly staring at it. And the other day, it was a beautiful day, and I said, my goodness, why don't they look up from those things and see what a beautiful day it is? Look in the face of another human being and see the face of Jesus Christ looking back at them, because we're all created in God's image. Wouldn't it be nice if we could look up from that little false God that we pray to all the time and look up and see can you imagine if the shepherds had been checking their Facebook when the angels were sent oh, what's, what's that noise I wish that what's that Gloria and Excelsior I wish they quit that I'm trying to check my Facebook here can you imagine they would have missed it we miss so much because of that little false God that we bow to continuously Paul says to give thanks in all circumstances. Why isn't there more Christmas in our hearts? Do you remember the trouble with the Grinch? The trouble with the Grinch was his heart was two sizes too small. And you know what makes your heart big? What makes your heart big is giving thanks. Giving thanks. According to United Church of Christ minister Martin Copenhaver, one of my favorite writers, he says the more blessed we are, the less thankful we are. You ever thought about that? I've been in some really poor countries and guess what? The people are thankful. But the more stuff we got, the more we think we're self-made, the more we think we don't have to depend on God anymore, the more stuff we got, the less thankful we become. That should be not true of Christians. We should always be thankful. In thankfulness, we remember in humility and recognize that we didn't create ourselves. We didn't give any of these gifts to ourselves. They all come from the hand of God. Everything is a pure gift. We couldn't even save ourselves. And that's why Jesus was born in a manger. We could not save ourselves. This gift in a humble manger, manger and cattle stall. So like the Thessalonians, we walk this Christmas season among a pantheon of gods and goddesses, indulgence, busyness, sentimentality, and distraction all call us away. But I hope that in these parting shots of Paul, we will hear a clarion call to not let these gods pull us away and cause us to forget that the reason for the season is so that we can come unto Bethlehem and see the one who is the answer to humanity's prayers. Amen. Our declaration of our affirmation of faith today comes from the Declaration of Faith, one of the more recent uh, summaries of what Presbyterians believe. I invite you to join me in standing as you are able. Jesus Christ stands at the center of the biblical record. The Bible is the account of God's word and action in history, together with his people's response in faith. It tells how the Lord has moved with Israel and the church towards the kingdom of God, his just and loving rule over all. It is the story of the one God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That story is still unfolding, and in faith we make it our own. It forms our memory and our hope. It tells us who we are and what we are to do. To retell it is to declare what we believe. Beautiful summary of what we think. Please be seated. 
in this holiday season, we find all these false gods, many demands upon our time and resources. Yet in worship, we are called to remember who is the author of all that we are and all that we have. In response to God's gracious action in our lives, we are called to give an offering to God. Will the ushers please come forward for the receiving of the morning offering? Thank you, God, for all that we have and all that we are. We take these gifts given today and we dedicate them ever and only to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I've mentioned before, uh, Claire and I like to drift around in the Sunday school classes and it's always interesting to hear uh, everybody's prayer request. It's, it's interesting uh, kind of potpourri of different types of prayers. Uh, people are praying for relatives who are recovering from surgery. They're praying for traveling mercies for those who are on the road. Uh, they're traveling for pe uh, praying for people who are recovering like the uh, automobile accidents, things like that hip replacement surgery, um, that one uh, would be pretty tough to recover from, wouldn't it? So we're always praying. And I know you have somebody on your heart today, somebody special, somebody that you're really praying for. I know who Claire has. Uh, I know uh, that she has a, a niece uh, who had uh, colon surgery, cancer this week. So I know that's who she, I know all of you have somebody that you're praying for. And so this is the time in the service when we pause, get away from the busyness of the season, 
and we remember to bring our petitions before Almighty God. Please join me in prayer. O oh, gracious God, the Christians in Thessalonica have nothing on us when it comes to false gods. Oh, we are surrounded with them, and they will demand our attention, they will demand our money, they will demand our time, and we'll get to the end of Advent and realize that we've again forgotten what it's all about. We pray that we will leave those idols behind and that we will remember anew that Jesus Christ, the precious gift in a manger, is the reason for this season. We pray that we will sanctify Jesus Christ in our hearts, that we will take time to pray, that we will take time to remember. We pray, O oh God, that you will bless those that we have on our hearts and minds today, recovering from surgery, those who are recovering from loss, those who are going through a difficult time financially or going through trouble in their relationships and are in their homes. We pray for all of those this season. We lift them all before you. And so we pause for just a moment and individually lift those on our hearts before your throne of grace. We bring them unto you, O gracious God, and pray that your will will be done. We look around our world and we see a world that needs grace and peace. We see a world that needs to be open to the presence of the Holy Spirit, the God of all peace. We pray that you will bless those who are suffering from war. The innocent always suffer the most. We pray that you will bless all of them, especially the children. We pray, O oh God, that you will bless our church. Bless each member who travels and those who have family members who travel. Look down upon them in mercy and keep them in your protecting care. We pray that you will help it to be a good holiday season because we keep Jesus Christ in the very center of it. We remember now the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we don't have a lot of mountains to go tell it on or in Louisiana, do we? Maybe we should substitute go tell it from the bayou. I don't know. Uh, but uh, the, well, I guess we'll sing the original words, go, uh, go tell it on the mountain. Uh, please join me as we have this celebratory hymn as we get ready to go and serve God this week. Go tell it on the mountain. Hymn number 29.
you know, uh, uh, the sun moves around. We're in the shortest days of the year right now. Uh, but the sun, this time of year, I'm sure you've noticed it, comes up right in the cross. Have you noticed that? Isn't that beautiful? Uh, the, the cross just shines brightly uh, during this uh, time of the year. And we're grateful uh, that you came today to worship the Christ child, the reason for the season. Let us now go and prepare to serve him in the coming week. May you leave this place remembering that we are witnesses to Christ in the midst, in our midst, and let us share the ultimate hope we have for his advent. And may the peace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.